everyone, it's Sophie from Belgia Jungle and today I'm going to be talking about my top 10 favourite plants to grow and that I would recommend to other houseplant growers to add into your collection. But before I do, I must address this behind here. What basically happened there was that there was a wasp nest in the vent in my room uh, and obviously that had to come out and Aaron did that. Here's a picture of him looking so proud holding said wasp nest. But it hasn't been plastered yet, so please ignore the hole. So without further ado, here they are. Starting out at number 10, we have Calathea arbifolia. She is so beautiful and perfect. Sorry, Monstera. Oh, look at those leaves. I'm obsessed with this plant. Some of you may be currently shouting at your TV, computer screen, various mobile phone devices. Sophie, why have you put a Calathea on this list? They are such crispy <laughs> And yes, they are, usually. But this one is an exceptionally easy care Calathea. I mean, you can see on there, she ain't got no crispies. The only bit of damage on this plant was on this leaf and it happened in the garden center, which is why I got it for a discounted price, which I don't understand because to be honest, that's such minimal damage. It's these beautiful full leaves that give this plant its name. Or be referring to the round, large shape of the leaves, and folia just means leaf in Latin, so it's like Calathea round leaf. The leaves just have this pillowiness that I just crave in plants, and the veins create this lovely stripy pattern, and it's a lot more subtle and more versatile than some of the other Calatheas that are like boom colour patterns. Wow, I feel like she's more elegant, sophisticated, magic wow. It's an exceptionally easy care plant. Mine lives right next to the radiator all the way over here. Because it's at the end of my bed and I just like to stare at her. But just for a comparison of how much easier this is than other Calatheas, right next to a radiator, no crisping whatsoever, really far away from the radiator, crispy. I feel like you can't tell how crispy she is. I have cut some of this crispiness off. But look. Super crispy, Ugh, medallion, why? As long as you are keeping it consistently moist and not ever letting it fully dry out, it really doesn't complain. I've even had this really be flopping down and completely dried out by accident a few times because I am dealing with chronic health conditions at the moment, which has made it hard to keep up with watering sometimes. So I'm all about easy care plants at the moment and she's just so beautiful and a very affordable plant as well. So if you are wanting to add this plant into your collection, my main piece of advice is keep fertilizing it as, soon, as long as it's actively growing and it'll keep giving you these lovely big leaves. Ooh. At number nine, we have a Hoya that I don't talk about very often on this channel because not much has changed with her since I bought her. And she's so tiny that I can hide her in this pot from you like this. And it is, Hoya Hush Kelliana Variegata, very posh sounding name. But if you're a variegated plant lover like me, you are going to understand how amazing this Hoya is, especially if you're a Hoya and variegated plants person, because look at that, it's stunning. I love it so much. I really like Hoyas. There were a few Hoyas that I was grappling with whether or not they would make it on the list because I love them so much, but it just came down to it and it ended up being that this was the only Hoya on the list. And if you're not a previous grower of Hoyas, I like them because they're so different because they have very stiff and waxy leaves. They produce these beautiful flowers that have little like bits of fur and they smell amazing. And I think it's because they stand out so much from the aeroids and other stuff that I tend to grow that I have fallen so in love with Hoyas. Please ignore my nails, by the way. I have not had time to do them. But this Hoya started out as a tiny, tiny little two leaf clipping from Jade Artful Plants. And because of the very high levels of variegation, I feel like it took a very long time to establish a root system. But once it had established a root system, it's fine finally started really going for it now and the new growth comes in this beautiful like hot pink colour before it fades to the green and yellow. It's just really different to the other Hoyas because even when this plant gets a lot bigger and trailing the leaves stay very small as opposed to something like my pubicalyx which has got quite big leaves quite fast but now this has really started to branch off I mean it's growing in 
two different places at the moment is pop popping. I can never say popping. It's popping out multiple new leaves for me all the time and I can't wait to see it really go for it this summer and I hope it gets really big and trailing like within the next few years because I've seen other people's like that and I am in love and I would love this for myself. God, my jaw clicked so loud. So I've got it in an aeroid mix because Hoyas are actually epiphytes. They need to have a lot of oxygen accessing their roots and also they absorb moisture from their surroundings and I feel like that's why this mix works very well in this room as well because it's very humid in here. It's currently 75% humidity in this room. So the last thing I want is my Hoyas to be like sat in wet, too dense mixes and getting rot. But that's not to necessarily say that people cannot grow Hoyas in a normal mix. If your conditions are very dry, you very may well be better suited to using a normal mix. It's very environmental. Because it has such a high level of variegation, it needs a lot of light. It actually sits directly under my grow light, about a foot underneath it. And it's been loving that at the moment and doing really well. So I'm gonna keep it with that. So if you like Hoyas, you like variegated plants and you have a lot of patience, I would highly recommend this plant. For number eight, I have a plant that's probably the most shown plant on this channel and that's because it usually hangs behind me in the background of my videos downstairs and it's the asparagus cetaceous sprengery. It's a type of asparagus fern that's a lot lot easier to grow than other types of ferns. It somehow managed to thrive so well in the driest coldest room in the house. It really adapted and it's kept growing all through winter. Harriet actually got this for me when it was very very small. I might be able to find a picture and it was a fiver from Asda because these are plants that you can very commonly find in the UK in garden centres and shops and B and Q, etc. And I think because of how it looks when it's small, it's often overlooked, but when you know that it can become this big trailing plant like very, very quickly and it is very satisfying to watch grow, I really think it's one that people should get a bit more hyped up about because it's such a cool plant. I also think I'm quite attracted to it because it's very, very different and I go for a lot of large leaf foliage plants as we can see and to have something kind of that looks spiky but it's soft. I just like that juxtaposition in my mind. And obviously this plant now has not only sentimental value to me but satisfaction value that I find is quite important to me with plants is when I've saved them, rehabbed them or watched them grow for a long period of time I become more emotionally attached to them. It's one of those plants that likes to be kept in a very moist substrate and if you let it dry out too much it will drop loads of little brown fronds everywhere and they grow back very quickly and they keep on growing constantly but also if you get irritated by cleaning up after plants like some people do that's one that you probably won't like but I personally don't mind because I love it so much that the pros outweigh the cons and if anyone's wondering why I didn't sh physically show the plant with me right now it's because that room has spider mites in it and I've not seen any on that shelf of plants yet but don't want to risk bringing it into my bedroom jungle because there are like 150 plants in here and we just don't want to deal with that. This is a plant that I fell in love with a long, long time ago when I saw it at a plant nursery and I was just instantly like love at first sight with this plant. Couldn't afford it. Years later, I saw someone on a Facebook plant group selling a clipping of it, an unrooted clipping, and I got that. And I've actually since split it into three different plants and one went to Jules. I have one here that's still growing from a leaf and then I've got this one that I consider the main one and it's Ficus villosa. Now from a distance and on camera it may look like eh, that's not that special but when you get up close like oh my goodness. Now historically I've not been a fan of ficus. I have a Australian fig tree, fig, is it fig? I think so, downstairs, and that's a type of ficus. Get on fine with that. And I'm partial to a ficus elastica, but there are many ficus that I don't like, specifically ones with very small leaves I don't particularly like. But with this, it didn't look like a ficus to me. Like, if anything, it's more of, the leaf shape reminded me 
of a piper. I just love hairy textured plants so much. I find it really sensory, really interesting. And this is the hairiest plant I've ever seen with hair on the actual leaves like this. I find it amazing and it's got this porous texture. The leaves are actually like so paper thin, which I think is one of the reasons this plant loves high humidity. Like this lives in a prop box. So my eventual plan with this plant is to get it to shingle inside a terrarium because it is a shingling plant. So it likes to grow with its leaves shingled flat against a surface, usually a tree up a tree, something like that probably a tree. And interestingly, when it gets larger, it becomes no longer hairy or significantly less hairy and kind of more porous looking, if you see what I mean. So given my history with ficus, I am very pleased that I've managed to keep this alive and also that it has still been doing so well for me. Like, I'm proud. I'm just glad that I've been growing this for so long, not had any major problems. It's still looking really nice. It's given me so many new leaves and it still fascinates me. And I just think the best description for this plant is unsettling in the most fascinating way possible. Coming in at number six, we have Begonia maculata. This plant was a rescue from a tiny two leaf clipping of a plant that I had from a plant shop that I was working at. And the rest of the plant had totally dried out, but I managed to just take that clipping and grow it into this huge plant now. And that has just given me so much love and appreciation for this plant. And it's grown, uh, branched off into three branches now, I think, has it, has it? Yeah, what? four, four branches. And I think this is one that's become a really big classic staple house plant for the whole community because most people know what this is, or at least that it's a begonia, because we just see them so much and it's one that you're instantly kind of fascinated by because not only does it have these sparkly silver dots of blister variegation on it that's very like, wow, <laughs> but also these striking red backs, which I've said before, are the le bouton of the plant world. And while many begonias have red or purple or various colour backs, this one has the deepest, richest red. It's like a MAC lipstick and it's wonderful. To put it bluntly, a lot of begonias can be absolute little and they don't get constant watering consistently and being kept really moist and having high humidity. But this one only gives you problems if you let it dry out, which I have a few times and we've got a little bit of crispy on some of the tips. However, it's not fussy about humidity. So if you do want to get started with begonias, this is one that can live at normal room temperature. It's also room temperature, room humidity. It can also live at normal room temperature, but that was not what I was trying to say. It's really easy to propagate in water, so I'm going to be propagating it and making a fuller pot eventually. The only thing is, I love it in this pot. I love it so much in this pot, and I kind of don't want to take it out of this pot, but it'll have to be eventually, because that's just the way of pots. This is one that grows very vigorously and very quickly as well. I mean, it's got so many new leaves on the go at the moment, and it just gave me this beautiful big leaf. So I really am trying to keep up with the fertilizing of this, and I've been using liquid fertilizer during watering. And I just feel like there's no better way to describe my love for this plant than to just say that when I look at it, it makes me feel like a proud plant parent for it to have made that journey with me. And yeah, come really far. Also, while I'm talking about begonias, shout out to Begonia Griffin, who I feel would have made it on the list if I could have justified it. But this was a rescue plant that I saved uh, last year from someone and I just don't feel that I'm attached enough to it yet to consider this plant a favourite. Like, I love it. I love the unusual leaf shape. It's very silvery. I'm so into this plant, but I just feel like we don't have a strong relationship there. We're not quite there yet. It's early days, but she's making such a good comeback. The leaves have sized up so well since it's been with me. It's got the winter blues down here. I need to fertilize, I believe. But all the begonias in this room better watch their backs for next year's 
plant favourites video because she is coming in hard. At number five, I have a plant that I think is universally considered a staple of plant collectors, especially anyone that's into aeroids, and she's already in the frame with me. It's my Monstera la la can't speak it's my monstera deliciosa albo variegated or monstera albo if you can't be bothered to say deliciosa and variegated every time for no apparent reason i'm gonna pick you up no it's okay she's not heavy because she's not been watered yet you actually look a, a little bit a little bit thirsty for anyone that's just recently very recently got into plants these used to be redonkulously expensive a few years ago. People were paying like a thousand pounds for a plant this size, a thousand pounds. People were paying 300 pounds for a rooted leaf clipping of this plant. And I didn't feel like remortgaging my house. So I waited until last year and I found this beautiful plant and I got it from where I was working at the time. So I got a nice little 20% discount on it. So I think I paid £60 for this when it had four leaves and I think I've had four leaves since. Yeah and I've got a two leaf clipping of it here which is actually it's rooted up really well and I think I'm gonna have them both in here going up a pole. And you know what by the time that I got this it became really worth it that I'd waited because I saw a lot of different Monstera shipments come into where I worked and none of them were as good as this shipment of them because every single plant had really, really stable variegation that was just on all of the leaves and none of them had huge big areas of sectoral variegation or sectorial, I can never remember how it's pronounced, which tends to go crispy and brown sometimes and it tends to lead to plants that produce full moon leaves and once a plant just keeps giving you white leaves, you usually end up having to chop it back quite a bit if it doesn't stop doing that when you're removing the white leaves because they can't photosynthesize um, properly without chlorophyll. So this one was a really good one. And actually when I was doing a TikTok live the other day, somebody thought that it was a Tycon. And I can see how you think that because it does look like speckly from a distance but it is an elbow it's just very very beautiful and I recommend that if you're looking to add an elbow into your collection and you were like me and you still haven't got one this type of variegation uh, is the type that will not revert because this type of variegation can disappear you can end up with just a normal monstera which I'm sure is not what you want if you're gonna be spending money on these plants. People often say that their Monstera albos are really, really slow growers, and mine wasn't like that. It has completely gone dormant over winter, but before that, it was quite a fast grower and it didn't take much time to settle into my environment at all. Like my other Monsteras, I've just found it relatively low maintenance. It just, all I really have to do ever is just maybe give it the odd shower, maybe, and then watering it. It's in a clear pot so I can keep a nice eye on the root system, which is all looking really good at the moment. And it's helped me be really accurate with the watering of this plant because when I first got it, like that's the most money I've ever spent on a plant. I have never spent more than 60 pounds on a plant before. I thought if something goes wrong with this, I am going to be absolutely kicking myself. So I'm glad that you've been easy. It was a nice surprise because honestly, I've heard bad things. <laughs> So really the main thing to remember with this plant is that it likes bright light but it's best that that comes from a grow light because it's really a bit risky with sun because there's so many factors that comes into sunlight about how hot the sun is actually going to be that day especially coming straight through a window and these white areas are really prone to burning. That's just something to keep in mind but other than that it's the same care as a regular Monstera and I would recommend getting an elbow over a Tycon because they can be prone to rot. Unless you really dislike variegation, this is a real, like, I, I just want to say eye-catching, but I keep saying eye-catching. It's a statement plant. She's a statement. Now, for number four, we have a funky succulent, which, if you're not new to this channel, you probably know that I'm partial to a funky succulent partial to anything funky and in general I'm just like having an excuse to say the word funky. Weird and unusual cacti and succulents are something I've had a growing interest in this year. 
and the plant that for me started off my love affair with easy care, I'm sorry I'll stop, is the Cotyledon tomentosa which is the variegated bear paw succulent because it looks like wee little bear's feet have grown on a plant. I can see and again we're seeing an undeniable pattern with me absolutely adoring plants that I brought back from the brink because this arrived to me as basically like three stems with like one leaf on each and I thought I thought I wasn't going to keep it honestly, I just thought there was no way that it would grow back but I'd really really wanted this plant, like it was a mega wish list, wish, blah, blah, mega wish list plant for me and I'm so glad that I kept it because it did manage to grow back. Oh, it lo looks like there's a leaf loose there. And I mean, I think it was pretty obvious that I was gonna go for the variegated one. I also do like the normal one. I thought there was someone that had gone on my neighbor's trampoline then, but I was imagining it. Occasionally it will give me a full little white paw, which I think is adorable. And I don't mind as long as it's only occasionally, because there's, there's one up there too and that's all right let's keep it at that again i don't know if you can tell it's very hairy but i feel like i need to resist the urge to touch it right now because i think it's a bit thirsty and i don't want to break it off if you like fuzzy plants it's very appealing to the sense or senses this plant grows very very quickly for a succulent it's filled out this pot so quickly for me and i love it and i have to say that i knocked a handful of paws off when i repotted this because it's very delicate and it still just keeps on going for you and also uh, you can only propagate this with a section of stem you can't propagate it from a leaf so if you're looking at this plant and you're like i would really like this plant then my number one most important piece of advice for you is to buy this plant in person because it's way too delicate to get it shipped to you like i did i pretty much always had this pot pot this plant in terracotta and it's in a sand based sand and grit based cactus and succulus succulus succulent mix the light it lives on a southwest facing windowsill over there and it also gets some light filtered from my grow lights but not like a ton so really i think it gets a mixture of light depending on the time of year but this one hates being above my radiator so it's much better for him to get light that's mixed over there than to be blasted by a radiator over there and again it's amazing to me that Calathea albifolia can live right next to it but a succulent can't. If you like plants that also tell you exactly when they need to be watered this is another one for you because it has slight wrinkles on the surface uh, of the leaves when it needs, is that a leaf? I think it's a leaf, when it needs to be watered and it's just a very underrated plant that I think will forever be in my favourites unless something goes horribly horribly wrong. Stop getting sand everywhere! Oh, in third place with the bronze medal for a favourite plant we have a plant that's quickly become one of my favourite genuses. It's an anthurium. But which anthurium? It's anthurium jungle bush and it's so big I love going like this with her. Like a merry-go-round. It was difficult very difficult because there are so many anthuriums. I mean this could have quite easily been a whole list of anthuriums because I adore them but it came so close with many many plants. Honestly I love my umbricola so much. I love the way I think it's called undulated leaves I think when they have that kind of venation. She's just impressed me longer. She's just been the one that I've fallen in love with and again at the moment I'm really into the plants that are easy for me because it makes me less stressed to know that these plants that I love are not just gonna go and croak the minute that I'm too ill to get up and water them. And it's very different looking anthurium to me because in my mind there's like clarinervium, crystallinum and the things that are the veiny kind of obvious alien-like anthurium. Then there's the strap leaf anthurium that hang down and have a kind of pendanty look to them. And then there's this guy and it's like this guy and anthurium bakery in a way and plowmani storm are kind of in a league of their own because they have these huge big leaves but they just stick up 
and stand in a different way. And in the wild, this would be growing on the jungle floor or in the crevices of trees and stuff because again it's an epiphyte like the Hoya and I feel like when you add this into a room it's just really something that instantly changes the way it looks. It's big jungle foliage and it's that instant jungle core kind of aesthetic. I love this plant, I love staring at it. I think that it's a plant that's best appreciated either at a lower level so that you can get the proper whole look of it or having it in a crate kind of presented sideways like that mounted on a wall the options are endless but it is one that unless you are going to mount it on a wall it takes up quite a bit of space like i didn't know for the longest time where to put it so i used to have it on the floor which i didn't mind because i'd feel again like i'm just in a full-on jungle when i was going to bed i've had a move around and it has a stand kind of on its own with a skin dapsis and there's actually four plants in here at the moment that have little babies that have grown off but i love this plant because i love a huge leaf it's as big as my arm always love that it's consistently grown for me i think this this leaf is the newest leaf because it hasn't hardened off yet and yes maybe maybe i've not fertilized it as much as it needed over winter but it's never complained about anything i mean it's happy because it's flowering and the best thing about this plant, well there's kind of two best things because again something that I clearly like in plants is that it doesn't require a whole bunch of humidity like some anthuriums do. Anthuriums in general prefer lower light and they are used to filtered light, they actually thrive better in filtered light because if they have too bright light on them then it easily bleaches the leaves so this just consistently puts out new big leaves for me despite being in lower light levels and when you compare how much it needs watering to other anthurium it's significantly lower unless it's root bound in the pot. It's one that you can't really go wrong with because because when it needs watering the leaves will hang down a bit and you will realise for and if something this damn beautiful can be easy to look after then I think anybody should have one and there are no crispy tips on this plant it's all really healthy and pests have always left it alone the only bit where and I just want to point this out in case anyone spotted it and thought that I was doing a big fib is that these lower leaves I used to catch them constantly in my drawers when it lived on the floor but other than that she's perfect in second place we have a philodendron and it's my philodendron burl marks variegata i feel like people didn't used to get as excited about this plant but now it's got a lot more people growing this which is great because it is so much fun to grow if you're a fan of surprises this plant is great because you never know how the variegation is going to turn out i mean I don't mind having the odd small full moon little thing there with a tiny bit green if it's just the odd thing and you can see that this plant constantly pushes out multiple multiple leaves at once right now let's see how many I can spot one two three four on the way right now and it's lost a couple leaves over winter what hasn't but I love her and I kind of love this weird crazy aerial root situation that's going on there it's cool, I like strange things. I think I'm just starting to see a little root down there, so it could do with a repot. You may be kind of recognizing this plant, but then thinking, but it wasn't variegated. Well, that's because there's a normal bill marks, which tends to be a, overall a bit of a darker green as well, I've found. And this basically started as a clipping of a bill marks that I was sold as a reverted clipping. So basically it was all completely green and then there was one leaf with the tiniest little bit of variegation on it and I chopped it all up and I ended up getting it to do this so it is possible a lot of the time to get reverted plants to become really high variegation again but you want to look for stripes on the stem and try and cut back to that point because stripes on the stem are usually a really good indicator of how variegated a plant is going to be. This is one that when things have got thrips, like when I had the greenhouse and when just plants in the area around this have got thrips, 
they seem to have mostly left it alone, luckily, because I've had a lot of plants be really, really damaged and had to have a long recovery period after thrips, but this one, they just didn't really like it. it. wasn't the taste for them. This plant is also a very vigorous grower, very fast. I think it was in my fastest growing house plants video. Come summer, like if it's growing me four leaves at once in winter in the UK, like in summer, this will be like boom, 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 huge. And I think it's quite impressive, like, if I also consider the leaves that have been lost over time or through winter, like, how big this has gone from being, like, a one leaf and then a wet stick prop to being this, and I've chopped it back for people to share the plant you love. Now, this plant isn't difficult, it never crisps up, I've never had a crispy leaf on this, only ever a yellowing bottom leaf, but it does a one thing that's very annoying, and... It's just that it always grows in such a thick mound that it's like how to attach a support and that's something that I'm definitely going to have a little bit of a explore into when I repot this when it's a bit warmer because I would like to do that but it does overwhelm me sometimes to look at something like that and think, oh, I've got to sort that out. And I'm telling you, you were so close to winning. You were so close because I've just loved this plant for so long, wanted it for so long before I got it, was so happy with how it turned out for me and how I got it to grow into this plant. But there is just someone who I just love that tiny bit more, and I'm sorry. <laughs> And the winner of the number one slot on my current favourite houseplants to grow list is Miss Philodendron Campy Lynette. Look at this. Oh, oh, frog. I'm always dropping frogs. He's fine. This plant is going to be something that you either really appreciate or you think, why are you bothered about this? But to me, this is one that I'd seen in grow tents for ages and it, it jumped straight on my wish list. I love symmetrical venation and I love this parallel veins that it has. Like they are so beautiful. It's so satisfying to my brain. And then to combine that, with an elongated leaf. The fact that this is a philodendron, but it's compact and climbing and not going to just stretch straight up at every support like my pink princess does, is very convenient as well. And honestly, I much prefer the way that these leaves hang like this. I mean, you've seen it lives right there, two and a half feet away from my radiator, but it's still 70% humidity there. But I've never had a problem with it whatsoever. It's beautiful. Every leaf is perfect. Thankfully, I've not had pests on it. It's kept growing, albeit slower than other philodendrons, but it's kept growing for me throughout the year. It recently gave me this leaf. You can see the new caterpillar there. And then as I mentioned in my last YouTube video, it's flowering. We've still not got the flower. It hasn't quite opened yet. But I'm very excited to have a look and a smell of that. And hopefully it's not awful. <laughs> When I first wanted these, ones of this size that I've grown it to now would have been like £60. I ended up getting like a much smaller little baby plant and I don't think it had the original two smaller leaves that it had before that and then it had these two leaves and I've grown it into this big plant and it's very satisfying but also it wasn't difficult to do at all because all you had to do was uh, keep it with bright indirect light and also uh, keeping it moist, not letting it dry out more than two thirds of the way down. Yeah, I can tell that by the weight of the pot straight away that this needs watering and also by the ripples in the side of the leaf there. But even though it's, it's dried out by accident, no crispiness and no ill effects and it will be absolutely a-okay. And that's why me and this plant just get each other. But she gets that I can't always be there for her, but she rewards me for the time that I do have for her and that it's a beautiful symbiosis. Whenever I'm feeling stressed and I come and look at my plants, this is one of the ones I can't resist touching. I love plants with ridges like this from the veins. I think it makes a nice sound. I think it's really relaxing. I think there's that element of plant care that people 
don't often think about, which is, you know, the mindfulness and the sensory aspect of it all and how it helps people with anxiety and, you know, different sensory problems. I just did this for what, like 10 seconds and I feel instantly like relaxed that I'm not even making that up. And I don't know if that's sad or wonderful. <laughs> because the leaves had stayed getting so big for me, like look how big that is. I hadn't bothered to put it on a moss pole, but I am going to because imagine if I could get leaves even bigger than this, it would be incredible. And she obviously has the prime position in my bedroom because She's right here in the middle of this and I just see her straight away when I come in the room. Oh, this plant, I'm like, honestly, I would die for this plant. <laughs> so if you like philodendrons, but you haven't heard of the Campy Lynette, I highly, highly recommend it. Beautiful plant, amazing to grow, just great in every aspect. Also, if you usually struggle with philodendrons, this one is much easier than any of the velvety leaf ones. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed hearing me talk about some of my favorite plants currently. I would love to know what are some of your guys' favorite plants. Do let me know in the comments down below. At the moment, I'm posting long form content on Friday, so please do hit that button, subscribe to be notified when I next make a video. I also post every day on TikTok there's all kinds of funky business on there and sometimes on Instagram as well so please do check that out I'm trying to do live streams at least once a week at the moment and if you fancy buying some illustrated houseplant products please do head over to my website it's buildrodungle.com and I hope you're having a great day thinking about houseplants plants.